Hello, Sojourners Church. Uh, this is a little bit different video. I, the, as many of you may know, the audio did not work with the streaming this morning, and the backup video did not work because the audio was corrupted at the source. And so I wanted to take a little bit of time this afternoon to preach this sermon again for those of you that weren't able to hear it, because I want you to be fed with the Word of God today, and I want to care for you, and I think this message is an important one for us to receive as a church. And so I want to encourage you with this. Uh, it's going to be different, obviously, than I preached this morning. I'm not preaching preaching to live people, but I'm preaching to a camera, and I'm preaching again for the second time. Uh, and so, uh, would you uh, pray with me as we ask God to help us? Father God, help me now to preach this message again, to be faithful again to the text. Thank you for the grace that you gave us this morning. Thank you for showing up in your word and stirring in our hearts. I pray that you do that again now. Uh, do that again for me and do that for the folks that are watching this later. I pray that you would feed their souls. Jesus, would you show yourself to be precious in your word and precious to the people listening? Would you meet whoever's listening to this in the point of their greatest need with your embrace with the gospel, with the precious truth that you have reconciled us with your Father. Uh, and would you help us see in this text how to be a family together, reconciled by your blood. We pray in your name. Amen. Now, this morning we're in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 1 to 2. And before we get there, I want to think about where we've been. In the letter to 1 Timothy, uh, Paul is instructing Timothy on what to do with this church at Ephesus, where Paul has uh, asked Timothy to remain and to address this issue of false teaching. Now, these false teachers were coming in and leading people astray. Uh, they were wolves among the sheep. And so Paul is giving Timothy strong directions to do things like urge, command, to, to, do, to do even to do things like handing over some to Satan. And Paul is encouraging Timothy to give these wolves both barrels, but he doesn't want to see Timothy take, take that strong, aggressive action and turn it towards the sheep that he's supposed to shepherd and love. Even as Timothy has to be very authoritative in how he deals with false teachers, Paul doesn't want to see Timothy bring that back to his congregation. He wants to see Timothy protect his congregation but then correct them with a different attitude, with a different demeanor. And so that's what Paul is talking about today in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 1 to 2. And so would you read that with me here? And Paul writes this in verse 1 of chapter 5. Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters, in all purity. So Paul says, do not rebuke an older man. He's talking about abuse. He's saying, don't abuse these family members, Timothy, but treat them as family. That's what Paul is getting at here. And we need this reminder for us today because we need to see how we are called to relate to one another as family in light of all the transitions that are happening, all the... All the um, things that we're having to work out with the return to normal in light of COVID-19. We need much grace with each other as a family, as we have differing opinions. And so that's what I hope for us to see out of this text this morning. So Paul is exhorting Timothy not to abuse his congregation. And there's three potential abuses that I see in this text. The first one is where Paul starts. He says to Timothy, do not rebuke an older man. Now, I'm calling that an abuse because Paul is not here saying that no rebuke of any kind should happen, right? In 520, Paul says that Timothy is supposed to rebuke elders who persist in sin in the presence of the rest so that everyone may stand in fear. Paul is not against rebuke. What he's calling out here is a certain kind of rebuke. The ESV just translates it straight rebuke, but other texts like the New American Standard Bible translate it sharp rebuke. And most of you, if you have a different, uh, different translation, probably have sharp rebuke. It's adding a little bit of something because there's a little bit different kind of rebuke. This is the kind of rebuke that Paul calls Titus to actually give 
false teachers when he writes in Titus chapter 1. He says this in Titus chapter 1 verses 10 to 14. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. It's false teachers, right? They're leading others astray. Verse 12, he says, One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. Rebuke them sharply. Notice the tone. They must be silenced. Rebuke them sharply. Compare that with me to the tone that Paul calls Timothy to rebuke those in his congregation with in 2 Timothy chapter 4. He says this in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 4. I charge you in the presence of God, and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, right? There's that word. And exhort with complete patience and teaching. So, so they must be silenced. Sharply rebuke them, false teachers. Those under his charge, his sheep, rebuke them with complete patience and teaching. It's a gentle rebuke. It's a call to Timothy to give the sheep what they need, which is patient and gentle correction. So Paul is saying to Timothy, don't do what you should do for your enemies and the enemies of the church. Don't do that to your family members in the church. Don't treat your family in the church as enemies. Feed the sheep and shoot the wolves, but don't shoot the sheep. That would be bad. Right? So Paul is calling on Timothy to do this. Now this happens in the church, right? I think of cage stage Calvinism, which I went through. If you don't know what that is, that's when you first discover the doctrines of grace and you're so excited about them that you want to share it with everybody. But often it leads to kind of a theological pride that wants to win arguments more than gently persuade others. And so you go around telling each other, telling others about the, the sovereignty of God and salvation. But you do it in a way that's designed to win the argument. That's giving sharp rebuke to people much older than you. And I know I've been guilty of it. This happens in the church. And Paul is saying, don't do that to your people, Timothy. Now, that's the, a clear command, right? A clear command to avoid this kind of abuse. But there's others by implication. The second one is at the end of the section for today, at the end of verse 2, where Paul writes to Timothy and he says to uh, treat younger women as sisters in all purity. What Paul is telling Timothy to do is to avoid any kind of sexual immorality, any kind of impurity in how he relates to younger women, especially in his congregation. We know from experience that this is a temptation for pastors, especially younger, younger pastors, right? Pastors that get in inappropriate relationships with women in their congregation. The statistics are depressing when we think about it. This is a temptation that Paul warned Timothy against. It's a potential abuse, uh, but I want to look at what is behind this abuse. It's not just that sexual immorality is wrong, but it's actually at the core of this abuse is taking an image bearer of God, someone who is made in God's image, made to glorify God, and stripping them of that image, turning them into an object, and using them to satisfy your own desires. That's what's at the core of this. It's a dehumanization of someone to use them to satisfy your own, uh, your own desires. Taking an image bearer and stripping them of that image. And Paul's saying, don't do that. Don't have any hint of sexual immorality among you. Instead, treat these women as sisters. Treat them as image bearers of God. Treat them as family members. So this abuse is saying, don't take and treat these family members as commodities. That happens, obviously, in the realm of sexual immorality in the church. But that also happens in other ways. Anytime we subtly take and treat someone as if they were created to meet our needs, to, to, get, to, to serve our desires, 
We are doing that. We are dehumanizing them to use them. We are treating them as commodities. Pastors can be guilty of this when we look at the people under our care and start to treat them not as image bearers of God, not as precious blood-bought children of God, not as family members, but as commodities, as either dollars and cents, right? People who can fund the ministry or as cogs in the ministry machine. When we look and say we need XYZ volunteers and we start to look at people and we see someone new and the first thing we think is, how much can they give? Where can they serve? Right? That's that's a way that pastors can fall prey to this. And Paul's saying, don't do that, Timothy. Don't dehumanize your people so that you can use them for your own pleasure. Don't do that. Now, he's saying, treat these younger women as sisters in all purity, right? And so he's calling Timothy to avoid even the appearance of evil. And sometimes in our efforts to avoid even the appearance of evil, we can end up not knowing what to do and actually abandoning caring for some in the flock. I've seen this in seminaries where it'll be difficult, especially for the young married men, to know how to relate to college ladies there. I even saw it at BCS, right? And what can happen in the church is that in an effort to maintain purity, in an effort to avoid any appearance of evil, the male pastors just don't pastor the women in the church. They just don't, they, they just avoid them. And this is another way that we can fall prey to abuse in the church is through neglect, through not caring for those under our charge. That's what Paul is warning Timothy about, but it's by implication. Notice he says in verse uh, 1 of chapter 5 again, do not rebuke an older man, but do what? Encourage him as you would a father. This call to encourage an older man requires that Timothy do something. He can't just avoid these older men in his congregation, right? And it goes for the younger men and the older women and the younger women because Notice there's no verb to go along with younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters. That encourage word is what goes along with all of them. Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Encourage younger women, younger men as brothers. Encourage older women as mothers. Encourage younger women as sisters. Paul is calling on Timothy to tend the flock, right? Reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. Care for these people under your charge, Timothy. Sometimes in an effort to get along, we can avoid those who are difficult to care for. Pastors do this too, right? In the flock, there can be people that are harder to love. Those who are particularly outspoken or contentious or those who are, those who are um, socially awkward sometimes or those, those who have strange ideas, strange theological ideas that we just don't understand. It's a lot easier to pastor those who are just like us, right? Than it is those who are very different from us. That's true for me as a pastor. That's true for all of us as we relate to one another, right? And so our temptation can be to avoid those people. But that's abuse of neglect. That's not caring for them. That's not encouraging them as we would a father or a mother or a brother or a sister. So Paul's saying, don't neglect your people, Timothy but care for them. All three of these forms of abuse, Paul is warning Timothy against. But it's not just pastors that can fall prey to this, is it? We can fall prey to this too, just in general in the church as we relate to one another. Think about how this might happen to us or how we might be tempted this way as we come back uh, from the restrictions uh, under COVID-19. Many of us have different views on what we should do or what what church service should be like or whether we should have church service or when we should have started or shouldn't have. Many of us have strong opinions about those things. And what might happen is that we might take those strong opinions and look at others in the church who have different opinions than us or who have a different take on it. And we might end up not treating them like a brother and sister, but actually turning weapons against them and treating them like enemies. We actually might end up doing what Paul is warning Timothy against, sharply rebuking those who deserve to be honored as family members. And then what might happen is we might start viewing those people that disagree with us or those people maybe that got their way when we didn't as 
obstacles to our own comfort or obstacles to our own feeling cared for or obstacles to our own desires. And so we might end up subtly dehumanizing them and turning them into either an obstacle that we need to move out of the way or turning them into someone we can use to get what we want. And friends, we ought not to do that. And then when all that doesn't work and it kind of blows up in our face, we might be tempted to just say, you know what, you do you, I'll do me. We'll just agree to disagree. We'll stay apart and we won't argue. We'll get along, but we won't be connected with one another. And that's neglect. We ought not to do that either. We can do better as a family. We're prone to do this in the church. We're prone actually to abuse one another in these ways that Paul is warning Timothy about. Why are we prone to abuse one another this way in the church? I think at least part of the answer, part of the answer is that we don't see each other as family. This is what Paul's remedy to this kind of abuse is, isn't it? Look at, look at what he says. Don't rebuke an older man. Don't abuse them this way, Timothy. But do what? Encourage him as you would a father. And younger men as brothers. And older women as as mothers and younger women as sisters in all purity. Do this, treat them like family instead of abusing them this way. That's the opposite, right? Treat them like family. But this is hard for us sometimes in the church, isn't it? Because sometimes we don't feel like family. Regardless of how you may feel about the church right now or what your experience with Sojourner's Church has been, I'm sure there's been times where you wish it felt like a family and it didn't where you struggled for it to feel like you really felt uh, like you belonged or like it was a family for you. Maybe you look around and you think, I don't, I don't know a lot of these people. I don't know them very well. It's a lot different relating to someone you grew up with than relating to a bunch of people you've only known for a couple of years, isn't it? It feels different. Maybe you look around and think, man, I don't belong with these people. We're so different from one another. Or they're so, they're, so, they're so godly and spiritual, and I just don't deserve to be here. Or you might look and say, you know what, they, those people are kind of ungodly, and I really don't think they should be a part of this. Like, we can, we can treat each other like that. We can look at each other like that, and that makes it hard for it to feel like a family. We look around and we say, you know what, I don't feel like I have anything in common. I don't feel like anybody has affection for me as a family member. This feeling makes it hard then to treat each other like family, doesn't it? But you know what? What I want us to see this morning is that we need to remember whether or not we feel like a family and even whether or not we act like a family. We are a family at Sojourner's Church. We are a family at Sojourner's Church and this is an ontological reality. Other than being fun to say, ontological means it has to do with what is. Ontology is the philosophy of being, what something is. In the ontological reality, the reality is that we are a family. Think about what a church is. We, we are church, right? Think about what a church is. Paul says in 1 Timothy 3.15 what a church is. He says this, I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in what? In the household of God, which is the church of the living God. The church is a household. The church is a household of God, and a household is a family. It has family members. It has fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters that are part of this household. The church is a household, and because we are a church, then we are the household of God. And because we are the household of God, we are family. This is reality. And it's reality not because it feels like it. And it's reality not because we want it to be or because we work hard at making it feel like a family. It's reality because Jesus himself has made us a family. That's why it is. Jesus himself has made us a family. And to see that, I want to take us to Ephesians 2. So Ephesians 2. Verse 11, Paul talks about this. He's writing this letter to the same church that Timothy is pastoring. And he says, here's what Jesus has done. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 to 22. 
Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Remember that you were separated from Christ. Separated from Christ. That's where we all started in Adam. We were not born into this family of the church, were we? We were separated from Christ. We were born under sin. And if you are not in Christ, if you are not trusting in Jesus alone for your salvation, then even if you come to Sojourners, you are welcome, but you are not part of this family. This family is formed by Jesus. And if you are not in Jesus, you are not part of the family. We want you to be, but you're not. And you need to come to Jesus first, who will make you part of this family. So that's where we all started, separated from Christ, alienated from the promises of God. But what did Jesus do? What did Jesus do? Look in verse 13. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. I know this is talking about what Jesus did between Jews and Gentiles and breaking down the dividing wall of hostility. I know that's what Paul is talking about. But what I want you to see is how Jesus himself, by his blood, in other words, by his work at the cross, Jesus himself made a new reality. And that's that we are family now. He made a new reality. He created in himself one new person out of the two, right? He reconciled us to God. He, he abolished what divided us. He made something new. We've been brought near by the blood of Christ. It's a new creation the church family is. And this new reality that he made is this in verse 19. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. That's what we are now. We're members of the household of God. This is a new reality that Jesus has made. It's an ontological reality. It is, which means as a church, we are a family. The truth or the reality under the truth of you coming to Sojourners, of you deciding, hey, this is the church I want to attend. The reality under that is that Jesus made us family. Jesus brought you here. Jesus brought you into this family. I can't speak and make reality. I can say the church is a family. I can say Sojourners Church is a family till I'm blue in the face, and it won't make it true. I can't do that. But God himself makes reality by his word, doesn't he? He speaks and it is. We see that all through creation. God speaks and it is. And Jesus is God's word, isn't it? He's the way God speaks and creates a new reality. And so Jesus himself, by his blood and by his spirit, has created this new reality of you and I as family in the church. This means then that our bond as family is stronger than our bond to our biological family, right? Our bond to our families is by blood. But this bond that Jesus has created us in a new family is by his blood and by his spirit. And that is so much stronger than anything else we can imagine. That creates the bonds of family for us. That's what we live out. So what this means then, because the church is a family, when Paul says to Timothy, when Paul says to Timothy, don't rebuke these older men, but treat them, encourage them as you would a father. He's not asking Timothy to pretend. 
He's not saying, Timothy, you need to kind of imagine like these older men are, are kind of like fathers and you need to treat them like you would your dad. No, he's saying, actually, Timothy, you need to respond to this reality. You don't need to pretend that they're your father. You need to respond to the reality that they are spiritual fathers to you. And the same thing goes for the younger men. They are brothers to you. So treat them like your brothers. Older women are spiritual mothers to you. So treat them like mothers. Younger women are spiritual sisters to you. So treat them like sisters. Respond to the reality that Jesus has created. And that's what we're supposed to do too. We don't have to pretend to treat each other like family. When I call someone brother or sister, it's not pretending that they're my brother or sister, right? I'm speaking in response to the truth, the reality that Jesus has made. This is what we get to experience as a church family. And so one implication I want to draw for us this morning, in light of it being Father's Day, is that we really do have a family as a church. And that means in the church, you really do have fathers. So as you look to older men in the church, they really are fathers to you. That means regardless of whether you think of Father's Day as a good thing, and you reflect on the good gift that God has given you in your father, and he was what you wanted in a father, and he was a good godly father to you, or whether Father's Day is painful for you, and you reflect on all the ways that your father failed or abandoned you, or maybe it's painful because your father has already passed and is no longer with you, and so you remember him, but it's hard because you miss him. Whatever your experience with Father's Day is, whatever your experience with fa earthly fathers is, you have a new reality that with this family here, you have fathers. You have older men in the faith that you can look up to and you can say, is it worth it following Jesus? Are these trials going to pass? Will God's grace be sufficient for me? What do I do? And these older men can speak truth and wisdom into your life. Now, I know that the older you get, the less older men there are to be fathers to you. But the reality of this text is also that we get to be fathers. Men, we get to be fathers to those who are younger in the faith than us. We get to be looked up to and asked for our wisdom and our perspective. And we get to share what a lifetime of following Christ has brought. We get to be that cloud of witnesses around our brothers and our sisters our children in the faith, if you will. We get to be that for them. It's true for fathers. It's also true for mothers, right? For women, this is true on how we get to care for those in the church and how we get to look to the older wise ladies in the congregation who've walked with Jesus for a long time and look to them and be encouraged by their faith. And it's true for brothers and sisters as we link arms and follow Jesus together. All of these relationships are true. We have a family here at Sojourners, not because it feels like it, not because we act like it, but because Jesus himself has created that reality. And we get to enjoy it as a good gift from him. So my exhortation to you from this text is to take heart and be encouraged by that good gift from Jesus. And then seek to walk that out. Seek to respond to that reality by encouraging one another as fathers, as mothers, as brothers, and as sisters. If we do that, can you imagine the testimony to the gospel that that will bring in our community? If we are a church that feels like a family, not just is a family, but feels like a family, what a good gift that would be to us, and what a good tool that would be for God to use to witness the truth of the gospel, that Jesus really does change hearts that Jesus really does create new reality, that Jesus really does reconcile us to one another and to his Father by his blood. That's such a precious gift. Let's seek to walk in that today. huh? Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity to record this. I pray that you would 
Help us to walk in this truth, that you would help us as a church to remember that you have created us as a family and to yearn for one another as a family and to care for one another as a family, to walk out these truths. We can only do it by your spirit at work in us. And so I pray that you would help us. In Jesus' precious name, for our joy and Jesus for your glory. Amen.